actually my godmother, she went to Dr. Jason Fung back in the day. She, mm -hmm. had, she was a diabetic mm -hmm. and she didn't want to make the lifestyle changes. Um, she didn't want to fast. She, she didn't want to do like the, you know, low carb. She didn't want to fast. She didn't want to, um, I think he was even like saying, you know, maybe try um, removing or lowering the protein and like being a vegetarian, like removing meat. Um, and she didn't want to make these changes at the time, but then eventually, you know, she ended up having a few strokes and, and they, you know, ended up having an amputation as well for, for her lower leg. Fuck. Um. Hey everybody, this is Sheree from Culture Toronto. I have my good friend here, uh, Pierre. Pierre, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Pierre Lafayette. Uh, me and Sharif, we go all the way back to U of T, um, where he taught me Muay Thai back in the day. And uh, we've been talking a lot about health and nutrition and you know what's the best approach to staying in shape. And yeah, hopefully we'll be able to uh, explore some topics today. Yeah, um, good point. I mean, the other content that we do is kind of uh, dicey and more cultural, but this is, I think our stuff is going to be more health related, how to be like your optimal health. You know what I mean? Like as, as, uh, as healthy as we can be. Um, and the topic I wanted to begin with, uh, with, with you is, is fasting, because I think it's kind of a hot topic right now. It's... Um, it's old, it's an old method, but it's kind of getting a lot of attention right now, especially um, uh, via advocates like Jason Fung uh, and stuff sure. like that. Like, I mean, how, how old is fasting? I mean, fasting goes back to like the hunter-gatherer times, right? Like, I mean, all pretty much all major religions have fasting as part of their history or practice from Christianity to Islam, you know, and you know, when you just think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, the way that we used to live is that we had to hunt for our food and we had to gather it. Mm -hmm. And this could take all day, right? It's kind of like when you think about animals in the wild, you know, like lions in the savanna, they spend their, you know, their morning, you know, hunting for the food that they're going to eat later on. And it's a similar thing. The fasting period has always been, there are going to be long periods of time where you're not going to have food. There's going to be feasts after you, you know, um, acquire the food, but then there's going to be a famine or there's going to be, you know, short periods of fasting. So, you know, even when you look at like societies right now, like in Kenya, you have like the Maasai Mara tribe, they still kind of, you know, keep these kind of traditional practices where they're not eating the way that we are eating right now, where we're just eating three plus meals a day. For most people, it's like three meals plus like two snacks or maybe even three snacks and you're eating till late at night. And, you know, the first thing you do in the morning is you have to eat. And we were just not designed that way, right? It's, it's always been the, the case, the reason why we can store fat is exactly for that purpose, for the periods of fasting. We store fat as the energy that we're going to use when we don't have food available. So, you know, it, it goes back to, to the beginning of human evolution pretty much. Yeah, I mean, uh, coming from like a Muslim, or a Muslim perspective, um, we typically fast from sunrise to sunset. There's sure. no food or water. And, uh, and I, I guess the fast is in Canada is typically like 12 hours or something. But when uh, we talk about fasting in like the scientific literature, um, I think we should qualify like what constitutes fasting and like what, what can you eat, what can't you have, and how long is like the bare minimum to reap the health benefits. Sure, yeah. I think that, you know, any period of time that you're not eating is technically you're fasting, fasting right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I think generally we, we look at periods that are longer than the typical, you know, the time between lunch and dinner or, you know, breakfast and lunch. You know, technically that's a fast, but people, most people don't consider it like that. But the, the constant fast that every single person has is when you're sleeping, right? So, right. From the time you ate your last meal or your last snack of the day to the point where you wake up and then you have breakfast, that is your typical daily fast. Oh, it yeah, used to be right, breakfast, break fast, right? Exactly, you're breaking the fast, so it's, it's in the name. 
And it used to be like back in the 1970s or something that people were very strict. Like, and it's, it's like this in France and like other countries, you know, where they still kind of adhere to like a strict, you know, kind of breakfast, lunch, dinner, or maybe like one snack during the day. Mm-hmm. And you don't eat outside of those windows. Whereas here, like kind of in North America, you know, especially in the U.S. and Canada, um, we're starting to see, you know, people just eating throughout the day, just snacking constantly. Grazing. And, uh, dude, right. I remember in university... Um, I, like all the guys who were bodybuilding said you need to eat like five times a day. Sure. Like, yeah. Or even more, the more, the better. Yeah. And that, that was the best knowledge at the time. You know, people really thought that that was the best way to, um, you know, gain weight and build muscle. Um, but it turns out actually fasting has numerous benefits, um, in that front, you know, because, uh, fasting actually spikes your growth hormone which is something, you know, people take um, supplements to try to increase their growth hormone. And you can do it naturally by fasting. So nowadays, you know, like, like I was going to say, like back in the 1970s, people used to have like a 12-hour fast, right? You would stop eating at, let's say, 8, and then you're going to eat again at 8 a.m., let's say, for breakfast. But that's not the case, you know, in, in the world that I've seen, you know, in the university days, you know, in, in the typical, you know, um, western kind of approach we're seeing people snacking late into the night you know watching sure. netflix and and um you know binging you know and, and eating till like 1 a.m and then they'll wake up and then they're eating again you know at, at 8 a.m so the, the the fast has become significantly shorter and that's pretty detrimental because you don't get a chance to let the body repair itself and get all those health benefits that you get from a longer fast so we'd be much better off if we had like the 12 hour fast, like we used to have, you know, back in the 1970s or some other, you know, countries have, but we're, and then we've also seen like, you know, this increase in all these illnesses and, and you know, cardiovascular issues and diabetes, cancer and, yeah, big... and all these, right. All these things are, you know, there's, there's a correlation here, right. It's not necessarily the only factor, you know, there's the food that we eat, the environment that we're in, the stress that we take in. But, you know, not letting our body get a chance to repair itself and recover um, is a very big one. And, and that's what you actually get through the fast. So for me, I think that you need to fast to really see the, the, the benefits that we'll probably talk about later. You need to be fasting at least 14 hours. So yeah, I was going to say 16. Hey, well, truly, yeah. I, like if it's me, I would actually recommend you do 16 to, to be safe. But I think the bare minimum to really get into the, the benefits um, you know, such as like the self-cleansing process called autophagy, which we'll probably dive more into afterwards. Um, you really need to be doing at least 13 hours plus, um, 14 hours is better. And of course, you know, like you can do a prolonged fast, which is a little bit more challenging where, um, basically you can go like 24 hours, maybe without eating or 36 hours or 52 hours or, you know, whatever you want, but you kind of have to build up to that point. It's not for you to just jump into yeah, I was going to say Muslims are going to hear that and think like that's insane. But during sure. that 36 hours, uh, you can drink water, right? Black coffee, yep. Um, yep. even like tea without milk, right? Uh, yeah, so I think that there are certain things that can knock you out of your fast. And actually, there's something called fasting mimicking diets where basically you just keep your calories super low. So it might be like you're only taking like 400 calories for the day. And that might be enough to kind of keep some of those benefits, depending on what you eat. Like, you know, if you eat something that's like high in sugar and then that spikes your, your insulin or, or whatever, your blood sugar, that's probably not going to be the best thing to, to keep you in that fasting state and to make sure that uh, the autophagy and like the, the cellular cleansing process is happening. So, yeah. So, I think, okay, okay. So we got 16, 14 to 16 hours. So... Just to keep yeah. it, the math really simple. So your last bite of food, let's say, comes into your mouth at 8 p.m. Mm-hmm. So you can eat at about 10 a.m. Sure, yeah. for 14 hours. And if you're right. gunning for 16, you basically skip breakfast and you have uh, your next thing at noon. Right, yeah. So it's actually, I mean, the hardest thing for people is because we have such a carb-heavy diet, a lot of people are really, really um, kind of addicted or dependent on the, the carbs, right? And, and they need that, um, you know, the, the glucose, they need, they need that sugar to basically keep them going. 
So when they wake up in the morning, like they're very hungry because of the fact their their um, glycogen stores have been depleted because they've been fasting at night. So the first thing that they want to do is, okay, let me get some food in me. Um, but it turns out when your body is adapted to using its fat stores, um, which it will be if you're fasting, if you you know you're doing intermittent fasting regularly, or if you're in a low carb diet, then your body starts to use uh, starts to get used to tapping into those fat stores. And once it can do that, you no longer really get hungry. So I've been doing the, the intermittent fasting for a while now, and I really don't get hungry. Like I, you know, like I don't. Um, that I do an eighteen-hour fast usually, eighteen hours and six. Mm -hmm. And during those eighteen hours, I'm not hungry because my body is able to tap into the fat stores for the energy that it needs, and I'm actually, you know, I'm full of energy, which is one of the benefits of, of intermittent fasting because you're not digesting all the time. Uh, yeah, like when I was first listening to Jason Fung, and we're gonna we're gonna jump into a clip uh, from Jason Fung in a minute. Um, he was telling the story where he asked his son, "Hey, uh, how do you think people can lose fat?" And his his son was like very young. I think he was like four or something. And he was just like, "Don't eat." <laughs> you know, sure. it's like it's like there's so many diets out here, like uh, talking about what you should eat, when you should eat. But if your goal uh, is is just fat loss, um, fasting is just logical, right? Like you stop using the food for energy, start using the fat. I think there was a misconception for a while, and like even in the bodybuilding community, and like people trying to, to um, you know get ripped, um, which was that if you're not eating and you're you know just fasting or you're you know um, reducing calories by fasting that your body would turn to muscle, like would use the muscle for energy. So it started right. breaking down muscle tissue. I've heard for that many times. And that's completely false. So it doesn't make any sense when you think about it from kind of the perspective of evolution, which was that why would our body be designed to store fat if when there's no food, right. we don't use that fat, we decide to uh, break down our muscle tissue tissues which are critical for us. Um, it just doesn't make sense. So... It turns out that like, and I used to do this too, like when I was trying to get lean, um, I would do the bodybuilding diet, I would do, you know, the six meals, you know, every three hours kind of thing, just lower the overall calorie intake. But it turns out that I would have had way better. And I've seen it already because like now when I fast, I've seen that I've gotten leaner faster because I can see that my body's really burning fat and not just breaking down muscle tissue. So a lot of times like I would do the, the bodybuilder diet try to like lose um, fat, but I would end up losing a lot of muscle as well. Because when you're constantly feeding yourself, your body doesn't have, your body's still using your, your glycogen stores. It's still, you know, um, relying on carbs. And okay, okay. it's you not going to... You throw out a term, a uh, glycogen store. You know, like, yeah. I mean, perhaps uh, not everyone knows what that is. Yeah, so th this is basically like how, like, when you consume carbs, which basically just break down to the same thing as like sugars, you know, simple sugars. And your body relies on this, this glucose um, to produce energy. Mm -hmm. Now, we used to, you know, for a while people thought that you needed to intake carbs to be able to function. Your brain needs a certain amount of, of carbs, you know, to, to function. And what will happen is as you intake carbs from your meal, you'll store it in places in your body like your liver. Um, and these where you, this is where you have like your, your glycogen stores. So this is the store of reserve energy, basically from, you know, the carbs that you, you took in. But it actually turns out that you can, uh, there's this process, I believe it's called uh, gluconeogenesis. Yeah, gluconeogenesis. Where, exactly. So it's the process where you can take fatty acids or other things and convert them into um, to glucose, into, into glycogen, when you actually need the energy. So you don't actually need to intake any carbs. So you can have a zero carb diet. People are doing it. it's called a carnivore diet, mm -hmm. where you're basically just intaking protein and fats, and your body, your liver is able to, you know, produce the the, the glycogen that you need for your brain for, for the rest of your body to function. And you can also um, there's this thing called ketone bodies, where um, you know people have heard about the ketogenesis and the, and the keto diet, and this is basically the idea that your body can now run off of these ketone bodies. And your brain, you know, runs more efficiently because it's probably, it's the cleanest way, you know, to fuel your body because it's, you know, this is what your body was designed to do is to run off of your fat. Yeah. And, um, that's a, it's just a concept that's not intuitive, especially 
like growing up with the food pyramids and dietary recommendations, you remember there'd be like a, a, a plate and like, a, you know, a bunch, a, a good section of that is like carbohydrates and you got like a little meat and like a little fat. Um, but really, the research is showing like you don't really need that much carbohydrates at all um, because like you were saying, your body can make uh, the sugars from the fats. Exactly, right. So your body, you know, your body, you know, is a phenomenal kind of, you know, chemistry, you know, beast where it can, it can make whatever you need, whatever hormones you need, whatever, you know, vitamins that, you know, it can generate them from, you know, the foods that you intake. And it's no different with, um, you know, the, the energy needs that you have. And when you think about it, most, you know, like if I, we go back to the Maasai Mara, you know, the tribe in, in Kenya, they're like, their diet is like, primary carnivore right like yeah. they're mostly just eating meats and with and this is how we evolved right you know hunting and, and gathering like the the fruits and the berries and the things like that you wouldn't get them that often right like it's only seasonal that you would have access to those things so where our bodies aren't really designed to be just constantly intaking high levels of carbs this is kind of like and um you know it leads to you know the development of insulin resistance which um, a lot of people argue is one of the biggest um, cause of illness you know from from cancer to you know diabetes obviously and um, metabolic disease and, and cardiovascular disease so it definitely like you know it, consuming a high carb diet you know can increase your cholesterol increase your, your blood pressure you know all these different um, negative things are happening from um, eating that kind of way you really don't need to we can really have a lowered um, carbohydrate intake uh, and survive just fine. We did it for, you know, thousands of years. Yeah, I think this is a good segue to jump into some Jason Fung. Um, but I just wanted to just offer an anecdote because I have family members who have diabetes and um, I've told them, like, you know, there's this doctor in Toronto. He's, uh, he's recommending uh, fasting for, to completely reverse type 2 diabetes. He wrote the Diabetes Code, well, it's right here, the Diabetes Code uh, by Jason Fung. Um, but if you tell most doctors, like, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm diabetic type 2, and I want to start fasting to improve my blood sugar, um, the responses that my family members have gotten are that you're crazy, you're going to hurt sure. yourself, you don't know what you're doing, this is super dangerous, don't do it. You know, and... and yeah. um, yeah, I was going to say, I think that there's a big stigma on the term fasting because people, they equate it to starvation, um, yeah. which is not what it is at all. You're basically just using your body the way it's designed to be used. And it's kind of, yeah, I think people have, and because people are so addicted to carbs, they feel hungry all the time, right? Yeah. So they, they think to themselves, hey, that, that last time when I, you know, I, I missed breakfast and I was super hungry, I was starving by the time it was 12 o'clock they equate that to something is bad, you know, something is, this is not good for my body. But it turns out that what's not good for their body is that they have addiction to the carbs and the carbs are causing them to feel this hunger when they don't really need to because their body's not adapted to consuming fat for energy. So, it, you know, it turns out that it's, it's a fairly, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, time tested thing. Like we've been, you know, we've been eating this way with fasting way longer than we've been eating this modern way that we've been doing in the last, you know, decades you know you know just it's, it's very recent right it's only yeah. been like maybe the last 30 40 50 years that we've been eating so frequent and, and so high carb um you know it's been a big change for us but um actually dr fung you know uh, dr jason fung was um pretty much the person that put me on to intermittent fasting because um i originally heard about george st pierre uh, using intermittent fasting to cure his uh, ulcerative colitis which is kind of like an autoimmune disease um, which kind of like almost put him into retirement. I think it did put him into retirement because he had that like before the Michael Bisbing fight and it almost like made him cancel the fight because, he, you know, it, it's a condition that causes like severe cramping and pain and, and bleeding um, during bowel movements. So he, he really, he was just like us, you know, where, you know, he thought that you have to be eating all the time. Like obviously this guy is burning so many calories like through his training for the UFC that, you know, he probably has to, like, consume, like, 10,000 calories or something crazy like that in yeah. a day. So he just thinks he has to eat all the time, even if he's not feeling hungry. And, of course, that puts a lot of strain on your digestive system and can cause, you know, all kinds of issues. So probably eating that way causes ulcerative colitis. 
And he, you know, went to Dr. Jason Fung in Toronto and Dr. Jason Fung put him on intermittent fasting and he started doing it. And then he said all his symptoms started to get better and he started to improve and he started to have more energy. And then he looked back and he was like, I wish I had known this, you know, while, you know, my whole career because it would have changed the game for him. And I think he's been doing intermittent fasting since then. So yeah, that's kind of when I heard that story, that's when I started to dabble in it. Okay, that's a sick intro for Jason Fung. Let's do this. Medical science is changing. For example, when we started talking about intermittent fasting, which is truly a, a method, a diet, it's literally the oldest dietary intervention known to humanity. It's been used for thousands of years. And we know that if you don't eat, nothing bad will happen. You'll burn some sugar, you'll burn some fat. That's the reason you have body fat, so that if you don't have anything to eat, you're going to burn that fat. So nothing bad really happens. So intermittent fasting, for example, five years ago when I started talking about it and using it for patients as a therapeutic option, because we don't make anybody do it. We can't make anybody do anything. We we give them the option to do it. Um, Everybody thought it was the craziest, stupidest idea they'd ever heard. And just last month, I went to San Diego to give the keynote lecture for the Obesity Medicine Association, which is the largest association of of, uh, obesity uh, specialists in the United States. And there were hundreds and hundreds of doctors there wanting to know about how to use intermittent fasting so that they could also make their patients better. Uh, The problem is, uh, I think that the doctors and the medical community in general is very slow to change. And that's really one of the reasons why I go to sort of popular books and social media because this is a message that doesn't need to be delivered to the doctor to change the message. We want people to kind of be empowered. Um, and, and the thing is that medical science, everybody thinks it moves very fast, is very, very slow. So. You could have debates ongoing. If your blood sugar drops, then you don't need to take medication. And then if you continue to not eat, you'll lose weight. And then if you lose weight, your diabetes, your type 2 diabetes will go away. Again, I don't think anybody is going to argue with that. So the question is, why don't we just do that? And that's what we do. I'm not going to make my patient, who, who I know in 12 years will be on dialysis, I'm not going to wait and make them wait 12 years assuming that I can actually get the funding for this. My duty to him or her is to take care of them right now to the best of my ability. So I do that. And we see cases every single day. So we have an intensive dietary management program. And every single day I come in and just this morning, for example, I saw a lady, 15 years of type 2 diabetes, on 80 units of insulin, followed by a specialist, an endocrinologist, um, I took her from 80 units of insulin to zero, and her A1C is now 5.9%, which is... A1C? That's like a... Yeah. Yeah, so that's usually like when they do the average over three months of your blood sugar. So the A1C gives you that, that reading. So I think under, uh, well, over 5.6 is the mark for prediabetes. And I think 6 plus is like diabetes. Classified because she's on no medications and her A1C is below 6%. She's actually classified as a non-diabetic. So we took a severe type 2 diabetes and in four months we moved her and and she was classified as a non-diabetic. This is a reversible disease. But I don't need to prove it to anybody. I need to treat people and that's what I do. I mean, it would be great if somebody gave to me a a couple million dollars to hire five or 10 researchers full time who can do a study, Uh, but that's not gonna happen. And I I I don't see that as a very logical solution. We can do both at the same time. So when you take the message out sort of directly to the people on the front lines, that is the doctors who want to be there, the, the, the patients who want to be there, they want to know because something like fasting, something like low carbohydrate diets, it's an option. I'm not saying that everybody in the world must do it. I'm saying you can give it a try. It's okay. If you do well, great. If you don't do well, then don't do it. But at least you have the option. It's like a tool in your toolbox. It's better to have that there 
rather than saying, oh, you must never do this. It, it's ridiculous, really, to, to, to give that sort of, um, you know, to, to take away those choices from patients when they should really, uh, you know, be empowered to, to, to make decisions for themselves. I mean, that's a bite-sized summary of what Jason Fung's all about. Um, sure, yeah. I think it's important to point out that Dr. Jason Fung is like an MD doctor. He's not a naturopathic doctor or um, any other type of doctor. He's a MD, graduate yeah, from a, U of T. Right, yeah, he's a nephrologist, right? So he's a kidney specialist. So he would see patients that are on like dialysis, right? Patients that have kidney function deterioration because of their diabetes. So he sees people when they get to their worst. Mm -hmm. And he said, how can we prevent them from getting to that point? You know, because at some point they're diagnosed with prediabetes and then diabetes. And traditionally, like the way that the medical world has been treating diabetes is basically, okay, we give them these prescriptions, we give them insulin eventually, and then we keep increasing the insulin as their condition gets worse and worse. But they never actually address the root cause of it, which is insulin resistance right. and the fact that they're intaking so many carbs in their diet. And, you know, this plays into the way people are nowadays where, you know, they want to pill for everything. If they have, you know, this illness, they don't want to make serious changes to their lifestyle. They'd rather just say, hey, I can take these pills. I can take these injections. And this is going to, you know, allow me to preserve my lifestyle. But the problem is that eventually your condition just keeps getting worse and worse. And then you get to the point where you start to have all these issues and Actually, my godmother, she went to Dr. Jason Fung back in the day. She, mm -hmm. had, she was a diabetic, mm -hmm. and she didn't want to make the lifestyle changes. Um, she didn't want to fast. She, she didn't want to do, like, the, you know, low-carb. She didn't want to fast. She didn't want to um, – I think he was even, like, saying, you know, maybe try um, removing or lowering the protein and, like, being a vegetarian, like, removing meat. Um, and she didn't want to make these changes at the time, but then eventually, you know, she ended up having a few strokes and – and they, you know, end up having an amputation as well for her lower leg. Fuck. Um, and but the interesting thing happened is eventually she started changing her diet, and she was able to reduce the amount of insulin she was taking to like only like a third of what she was taking. So and she she dropped her A1C to um, it's not below the diabetic range, but it's like pretty low. It's like in the you know in the sixes, like in the low sixes. And that is like incredible, you know, like that is reversing the condition, right? That is like, you know, bringing She's it back down. She's not diabetic down. anymore. Exactly, right? You know, once you get under that 6.0, right, that, that's not diabetic. So that's what in the video, Dr. Fung was saying that, you know, someone, you know, in four months went down to 5.9 on the A1C. And that is the definition of reversing your, your diabetes. And that can do so many things to protect your body because when there's so much blood um, sugar that's circulating that can cause all the damage to you know your veins to your arteries to um, you know that this is what causes the problems you know it can increase the risk of stroke and and uh, cardiovascular issues kidney issues you know all these different things so but the problem is the ADA right the American Diabetes Association I don't know what the equivalent is in Canada but their diet that they recommend is sixty percent carbohydrates so imagine that like you're a type two diabetic crazy and you're your problem is that you have too much blood sugar, right? It's too right. high. But right. they're going to recommend that every day that you intake 60% of your calories from carbs, which are going to spike your your blood sugar and, and increase the amount of insulin. Um, so, it, you know, it's pretty, you know, crazy that it's, you know, it's contradictory. But I think one of the problems that we run into is that a lot of research, a lot of like the medical world is funded by and it is influenced heavily by the, the pharmaceuticals. So... The pharmaceutical company that makes metformin or makes, you know, the insulin, they, they kind of control things because they can make a study that shows, hey, if you take my drug, it can extend your, your life and, and um, reduce your blood sugar or whatever and, and help you deal with, you know, these issues. Um, but no one's studying the alternative treatments like something as simple as fasting, right? There's not a lot of money to do a study on fasting, especially not a long-term right. study, which you really need. And, and so, if fasting works... Um, I mean, it's free, right? No, anybody it's can the, do it anywhere. No it's one the wins. Easiest thing. Yeah, it's so like, and that's the problem, right? It's free. It's the easiest thing. You don't have to cook. You don't have to yeah. prepare any fancy diet. You don't have to do anything. It's the simplest intervention that you can possibly do. And it's the most logical one, right? Like if you fast longer, it'll help you deplete all your glycogen stores. So now 
your the, the amount of blood sugar that you have circulating in your veins will has to go down over time if you're you know you're you're depleting it constantly. So um, Kara, you know, I've got to simplify one thing because I think that sure. this is this point um, I got from talking to you a lot and also from just listening to a ton of Jason Fung. And here's the thing: so you go to a doctor. Yeah. He checks your blood. He finds your blood sugar is too high. Sure. So he prescribes insulin, right? Yep. Insulin is a hormone that will lower the blood sugar. Sure. Yeah. So I, th I think the point that people don't get is that when he diagnosed that person as diabetic, their insulin levels were already elevated. Exactly. Yeah. So, th so this person already has too much insulin and the doctor yeah. is saying, you know what, let's give you more. But the problem with that is you just get more insulin resistant, right? Exactly. You're, you're resistant. So you, you increase the amount of insulin that you're intaking, but the problem is it's not being able to function as it normally should. So you need more and more to have the same result on the controlling the blood sugar. So that is exactly the problem and why, you know, you have this escalation of diabetes where you keep having to increase your dosage because you're not addressing the insulin resistance. You're just, you know, giving more insulin to, to someone that already has insulin that's too high, like you said. So, yeah, it's like really, like when you think about it, it's really a backwards kind of way to approach, you know, diabetes. And when you, when you think about like just a natural thing, like, hey, if my blood sugar is too high, I should probably cut the carbs, right? I should probably lower the amount of carbs I'm Stop taking. Stop bringing carbs obvious. in. Stop bringing carbs right. in, right? And it's not just like, I, I think probably most people will say, okay, let me cut out the sugar, like simple sugars, refined sugars. Obviously, those are really bad and they really do spike your, your blood sugar. But your the carbs that you take in, the grains, the breads, these things pretty much convert to simple carbs, you know, like to simple sugars once you start, once you consume them from a chemical basis. They're pretty much the same thing. They, you know, you know, there's there's something called the glycemic index, which will determine how much something is going to boost your, your blood sugar. Uh, but then there's also like a combination of things, right? If you consume fat with protein, that can have a huge increase on, on your blood sugar. So, you know, it, it's there there's things like that that you need to know, right? Like that. And then even protein, like even if you um, just intake protein. Protein also can increase your insulin to a lesser degree than the carbs, but you have to be wary of that too. The thing that has the, the least impact on your, your insulin levels, your blood sugar, is fat intake. So fat, if you just intake fat, it's not going to affect your, your blood sugar at all. Yeah, actually, um, I know we, I want to be sensitive to time here. I know you got to bounce soon, um, but let's just end on a few points. So fasting works to reverse type 2 diabetes uh, because you stop eating so you, you're ceasing to bring more sugar in and your body is forced to use the sugar you have so your exactly. blood sugar goes down sure yeah. your blood sugar starts to go down you deplete all the stores that you have you start burning fat and then the other thing is a lot of diabetics they're overweight and that also contributes to the insulin resistance to all these things. So once you start to lose the weight, that also correlates with your blood sugar going down. So you put those things together with like a low carb diet. Now you can really start to make like the, the leeway that like um, Dr. Fung was talking about in his video. But besides that, like there's so many benefits to, to fasting from reducing inflammation to increasing your mental um, clarity and focus to um, reducing cholesterol, um, hypertension, healing the gut because like when you're not eating it allows your body to get into that repair process we talked about autophagy which is basically the, the process of cell renewal where they um, rebuild uh, you know they take the damaged proteins and then they recycle them and then reuse them and rebuild them to a stronger um, structure and this can preserve your the integrity of the cell which is critical so this is why we've seen associations with um, reduce risk for cancer, reduce risk for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, neurodegenerative diseases, um, all these different things. Um, longevity is increased, you know, from, from doing these kind of fasting. And it, it's pretty insane. Like autophagy won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2016. A research of Japanese scientists, um, or a doctor did, a, did on autophagy, um, basically showed all these benefits that we've been missing out on because of the way that we've been eating. And if we, you know, if we knew about this, um, we'd be 
uh, optimizing ourselves to, you know, be in a state of autophagy as much as possible, whether that's doing prolonged fast, you know, once a month or whether that's doing intermittent fasting on a daily basis. All right, let's end there. The next episode, I want to do a deep dive on insulin resistance, what the hell that is. So we just briefly touched on it and then we got to go into autophagy because uh, more and more we're finding that fasting is like the magic bullet for so many diseases and uh, you did, we just we can't talk about this enough so thank you so much sure. for, for joining in uh, alright so we'll see you next episode alright peace